okay, let's get ready to yeah. start it. Mm. So yeah, it's four o'clock, so we need to uh, start. Um, this week's colloquium speaker is Marla Jiha. She's coming from Yale. Um, and she's a foremost expert on dwarf galaxies, but she actually started her career as an applied physicist at Cornell. She then, then got a uh, master's in astronomy from New Mexico State University and then a PhD from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, went on as a Hubble to Carnegie Observatories and a Plaskett Fellow uh, as in Victoria. And so as a postdoc, she did seminal work uh, measuring masses of some uh, very faint uh, newly discovered dwarf galaxies and realizing they have mass light ratios of many thousands, um, and thus uh, positing a solution to the, or at least alleviating the missing satellites problem by saying that those are the satellites that we've been missing so far. Um, and this work has been so cool that uh, she has been uh, Alfred Sloan Fellow, uh, also in, um, invited, uh, or one of the most prominent alumni uh, of the UCSC, as well as a brilliant then by the Popular Science magazine. Um, and later on, she was also a fellow of the Whitney Humanities, Kavli uh, Frontiers of Science, and most recently by the John Guggenheim Foundation uh, in 2015. And I think um, Marla's work uh, has such broad appeal because she really touches many different topics. And so in principle, she could give a, a topical seminar to any of our divisions here at the CFA, starting from uh, searching for, for quasars to uh, measuring the initial uh, stellar mass function to detailed dynamics of collisionless systems. And on a more personal note, um, it's been great being Marla's student uh, for many reasons, uh, but foremost uh, is the, the one that you had a chance to glance um, over the lunch today, and that's that Marla is uh, fearless to start a project in an entirely new field to her, and she's never deterred uh, by sometimes daunting prospects of answering really big questions. And so what we'll hear uh, today is our, will be the first results on one such project, which was a very long time in the making and took like a tremendous amount of uh, observational data and entirely new ways of analyzing it. But at the end of the day, it's going to all be worth it because uh, the Milky Way will no longer be the only L-star galaxy that we have characterized a, a satellite population for. So I give you Marla Chiha. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. It is genuinely and truly an honor to be introduced by a former student who I'm super proud of. Um, thank you for coming out today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project that uh, has been in gestation for many, many years, for about five or six years now. Uh, and we have our first results paper just out a couple months ago on this project called the Saga Project. Uh, this is, uh, if you came to lunch today, I talked about a completely different project, but the motivation of that project had come out of frustration. And I realized that this project also came out of frustration, so I'm seeing some pattern here. Um, and the frustration in this project was um, about five or six years ago, Risa Wexler, who is a theorist at uh, Stanford, and I were talking and just kind of lamenting about all of the, not lamenting, but we're just discussing all of these papers that were, um, making very serious inferences and conclusions about cosmology and about the nature of dark matter and about galaxy information based on the Milky Way and its satellites um, and surroundings. And we were saying that the Milky Way is a sample of one. It is just one uh, Milky Way out of a, you know, some distribution of the perfect Milky Way. And that wouldn't it be great to have a statistical sample of Milky Ways from which we can understand the universe? And, Naively, or because we just had gotten tenure, we decided to embark on this question, uh, which we knew would take a long time, which we knew was going to be a fair amount of effort. I don't think I, I fully understood exactly how much and how long, um, but it is really kind of fun to have our very first results from this project. So the Saga survey, the satellite, uh, our, our, our um, very proud acronym, Satellites Around Galactic Analogs. Um, the goal is to characterize the satellite populations, the dwarf galaxy satellite populations, around 100 Milky Ways, with the idea of being able to ask statistical questions of those populations. 
Um, and so the team, and I have this and the Saga team, which is only about three or four other people who pretty much just gave us comments on the papers. Um, it's a very small team. So Risa Wexler is um, my co-PI and the theorist uh, on the uh, project. Uh, Yao Yun Mao is a postdoc at uh, University of Pittsburgh and is really amazing and has taught me an enormous amount um, both on the observing and the theoretical side. And then uh, Ben Wiener and Eric Tollerard both have contributed a fair amount to this project. But it's a fairly small team. And you, will you see what we've done, um, it really is sort of uh, uh, amazing that we've accomplished so much and yet so little. Anyway, um, let me set the stage for this project uh, and give you kind of some history and kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, in this. So the problem as of maybe 10 years ago was as follows, that uh, dark matter only simulation, cosmological simulations, hierarchical um, structure formation predicted something like a thousand dark matter halos, subhalos around a Milky Way like object. And as of 12 years ago, uh, 2005 or so, we knew of 11 satellites around the Milky Way. And at that time, I would have argued that those are all of the satellites around the Milky Way, and it's probably a complete sample. Um, and it turns out, of course, I was quite wrong. Um, and that we have now started to discover a whole new population of dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, as of just a couple months ago, I think their count is 54 known dwarf galaxy satellites around the Milky Way, that number uh, probably plus or minus a few. Um, and that is not the talk I'm going to give today, but the difference between those two numbers, 11 and 54, is that 54 we know is an incomplete number. So these new galaxies have been found algorithmically rather than just looking at images. Uh, they have to be done in uh, you know, catalogs, looking for over densities of resolved stars. Um, and this number has just increased recently from a new influx of dwarf galaxies found in the DECAM um, uh, surveys, and it's probably just going to continue increasing. And this missing satellite problem is now sort of more of a missing satellite, perhaps, issue. And people have started to look at this in a little bit more, uh, with a little bit more subtlety. So this is a historic plot, but uh, kind of will guide my story. So this is from uh, a paper many years ago with Josh Simon. The cumulative number of satellites around the Milky Way is on the, uh, on the y-axis, and the mass of the satellite, um, and this is uh, the velocity, um, is in this direction. So smaller things here, uh, more massive things on this side. And this is a state in 2007 that uh, we knew of 11 satellites. Uh, and these are the predictions. So those are the observations and the predictions. And this is this missing satellite, where there's a factor of maybe a 10 or 1,000, uh, 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 sorry, a 10 or 100 uh, difference between the observations and predictions. Uh, we now think that uh, this, at least at the low mass end, is less of a problem. Here are our observations, something like 50 satellites, doing some kind of completeness correction um, with large error bars. Uh, perhaps the number of low mass satellites is already up to the number that is predicted from um, dark matter halo simulations. So the missing satellite, at least in its first um, formulation, is probably not much of a problem anymore. But what you'll notice, and it took me three years of staring at this plot for me to personally notice this, is that there's a problem going on at the bright end that has not been changed and has not changed in the last uh, 15 years. So these two objects here, this is at two, those are the Large Magellanic Clouds. And predictions of a Milky Way mass halo uh, would predict that we probably shouldn't have a Magellanic Clouds, or perhaps it's something of a rare event. And furthermore, uh, sorry, uh, so predict that there's a, a, a problem here. And so you can ask whether or not the Milky Way should have Magellanic Clouds by going out into the universe and asking if other Milky Way-like objects have Magellanic Clouds. And that was done um, kind of in a whole flurry of paper from a bunch of different groups um, in 2011, 2012, by looking at the Sloan Digital si Sky Survey, selecting on what a Milky Way is. And we'll talk about what a Milky Way analog, what, how we'll define that. Um, spectroscopically finding objects, galaxies that were gravitationally associated with those primaries, um, and just asking what the numbers were. And the general consensus in all those papers is that the Magellanic Clouds are rare, but not yet uncomfortably rare. And so here, a uh, paper from Risa Wexler's group. This is um, the number of satellites. So here's one satellite, two satellites, three satellites. This is observational data, but this is uh, roughly consistent with uh, predictions. And that having two satellites of a Magellanic cloud-like masses is sort of at the 5 to 10% probability. 
Um, so it's not uncomfortable. It's perhaps a little strange, but not anything that someone is going to get, you know, like stay up at night. So that's the Magellanic clouds here. But what you also notice is that there's still an issue um, under predicting the number of dwarfs um, uh, in sort of the 20 to 30 kilometers, 20 to 50 kilometers mass range. And that is not going to change with more observations. That is, it's very unlikely that we are going to find more objects that are sort of a Fornax or Leo 1 size object. So something with stellar mass of 10 to the 7th or greater. Um, you know, there might be one hiding behind the galactic bulge if we're like really unlucky, but it's, it's unlikely. And so um, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the numbers, but in addition, um, there is also a problem here that's not obvious on this plot in that the properties of these dwarfs, uh, oops, that was my problem, sorry. Um, the properties of these dwarfs uh, are also not quite consistent with simulations. And so this is sort of the newest uh, version of the missing satellite problem is called the too big to fail problem, sorry. Um, and this is Mike bullen Colchin who first presented this problem, but it has been uh, studied by many other uh, researchers. And this is the idea that if you take a Milky Way mass halo and you give the two most massive subhalos to the Magellanic clouds, and then you ask where are the rest, how massive are the rest of those subhalos? Um, here are the next top ten um, dark matter halos. So this is the circular velocity versus their um, versus size. Um, and here are the next top 10 subhalos in that simulation. And the observations, each dwarf galaxy around the Milky Way is a single point in this plot. The observations all lie below it. That is, the density of the brightest satellites is far too low as compared to what's predicted. Now, these are just dark matter simulations, and so hold on for a second. Another formulation of this problem, which I think is actually an easier way to think about it, um, is from uh, Frank Vandermosch and his student at the time, Arthur Yang. Um, there's a luminosity gap between the Milky Way, uh, sorry, between the Magellanic Clouds, um, again, here's uh, a proxy for mass, and the next brightest satellite. So it's actually quite large. Um, and this is not what we see in simulations. And so these two things together uh, made us a little bit worried and wonder how we might be able to solve this. And so the question is, you know, is this too big to fail and, and associated problems? Is this something that we can solve? And the answer is yes, 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 and yes. We can solve it in many different ways. Um, and they're all fairly plausible solutions. So one way you might say is, look, the problems are coming from comparing dark matter simulations to the baryons that we see. And so if you add baryons into these simulations, um, you might be able to solve this. And the answer is, yeah, you can definitely solve this um, if you add baryons. You can also solve it if you change the nature of dark matter just slightly. So if dark matter is slightly warmer or perhaps self-interacting, you can also solve um, this too big to fail problem, the density problem. Uh, you can also solve it if you have a slightly smaller Milky Way mass. You can also solve it if you suppress star formation in certain ways in various different dark matter halos. You can modify the power spectrum. You're kind of getting the idea here. Um, and so these are all sort of fundamentally important questions that we would like to use the Milky Way satellites to answer. Um, and what we want to do is differentiate between these solutions. Maybe all, all of these solutions are right at some level, but we'd like to understand that. And the way to do this is to step away and say, look, the Milky Way is only one. Um, let's try and understand the Milky Way from a more statistical point of view. And from that way, we can start to differentiate between all of these various different issues. OK, so if we wanted to do that, if we wanted a statistical sample of Milky Ways, what would we want and what would we need to do? Um, so first, we would like to get satellites, that is, be able to um, observe and detect satellites down at least below this luminosity gap, and maybe even you know, a little bit beyond the luminosity gap, so we're, so we're happy. So um, the project that I'll talk about today, we like to get down to something about LEO 1, which is a mass right here. So uh, a stellar mass of something like 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7th. Um, and so that is where this project, the Saga project, was born. Um, and again, I want to kind of stress this is, a, um, for me at least, an interesting gen um, genesis of a project where um, I am coming at the, this question from a very observer-oriented uh, point of view, trying to figure out how we can do this observationally. Um, Risa Wexler is coming at this from a very um, theoretical point of view. How are we going to use these results to compare to models? And so those two in occasionally intention um, uh, uh, motivations, I think, led to a much stronger uh, survey in the sense of how we designed it. 
Um, so the goal of the survey is to use the satellite populations to shed light on all of these sort of big questions, on galaxy formation, on dark matter physics, and better understand the Milky Way in a cosmological context. So what are our uh, observational goals? What we'd like to do is pop, uh, characterize the populations of about 100 Milky Ways, and 100 is coming from just under, you know, assuming what the scatter is in, you know, the um, uh, satellite function and also trying to get, build up the numbers. If we only have a handful of satellites around one object, we need a lot of objects to have some statistics. Down to uh, LEO1, which is, again, an absolute luminosity of minus 12, stellar mass of something like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7th. Um, this is completely uh, uh, motivated from an observational point of view. This is equivalent to about R of 21, which is about where we can do spectroscopic surveys. So down to that limiting magnitude, the, Mil the Milky Way should have or has five satellites. So the Magellanic Clouds, the dis Disrupting Sagittarius Dwarf, which was talked about at ITC lunch today, um, Fornax and LEO-1, so five satellites. And so what we're doing is looking for satellite luminosity functions where we expect something like five objects around something like 100 Milky Ways. Uh, I guess I should have plugged in. There we are. OK. Oh, no. OK, so here are the results. What I want to do is kind of motivate the results and explain why this is hard and then kind of go through all of the, um, the lovely details. Um, so here's a preview of the results. We have so far uh, achieved our goal for eight systems. So for eight Milky Ways, we have complete luminosity functions down to the LEO1 dwarf, out to the Vera radius. And I will define essentially every single one of those sentences, or sentences, every single one of those words with a slide. Um, but what you can see here is these are all things that I have defined as being uh, similar to the Milky Way. Their host galaxies are right here. The circle is the virial radius around those objects, so out to about 300 uh, kiloparsecs. Um, and the green circles are the satellites that we have found. And down to the limits uh, of our survey, I can tell you that there are no more satellites to be found. That is, we have completely um, gotten follow-up for every single object that has a likelihood of being a satellite in these systems. And so you can kind of start to see there's some interesting differences. So here's an object that has nine satellites where the Milky Way should have five. Here's one where there's only a single satellite. And again, in these systems, I can say with confidence uh, that we have uh, complete luminosity functions. So eight satellite or eight systems is not 100 systems. Um, and you might ask, why do I just like say uh, not give the talk and wait a couple minutes and then get more systems? This is an enormous amount of work. So this took about five years, something like 27 nights of four meter time, um, to discover these just few uh, satellites, 25 new satellites. So let me give you a sense of why this is hard. So uh, here's a test. Uh, I won't grade you. Um, there are one satellite in each one of these rows, um, and the rest are background galaxies. Um, and so I would like you to guess which one of these is the satellite. And you can just do this in your head. You don't need to raise your hand. Um, and I would, I would say you probably can't guess. Um, so these two are satellites. Someone's going to guess right just randomly, right? We can calculate that probability. Um, so these are two satellites associated, gravitationally associated with their hosts. These are at redshifts of about 0.01. And the rest of these objects have similar colors, but um, are redshifts for us, which are substantially larger at 0.1 to 0.3. And so the problem here you can sort of see, but I will uh, quantify, is that things like photometric redshifts fail when we're trying to go to these distances, basically fail at low redshifts. And so we're going to have to come up with some sort of clever way to try and get around this problem. And so one question you might ask is, well, why are you actually looking at dwarfs that are at, you know, at those distances? Why don't you do something that's a little bit easier? And the problem is, is that we are trying to get a statistical sample. And if you want 100 Milky Ways, you have to go out to a certain volume. And that volume pushes us to these redshifts. OK, so that means how am I going to define a Milky Way, um, and which will lead us to the, this volume question. So how will we define a Milky Way? And the science questions that I've presented to you are really aimed at comparing galaxies that have the same dark matter halo masses. That is, 
um, you know, what, what is the halo mass, what is the dark matter mass of the object? And obviously that's something that I can't just like go out to a telescope and measure. Um, so we have to be a little bit clever here. And so we have made assumption, and given this single assumption, this essentially drives the rest of the survey. So we have assumed that the Milky Way halo mass is this number, 1.6 times 10 to the 12, which is, um, if you look in the literature, is basically in the middle of the, the range of Milky Way halo masses that people have inferred. And we assume that there is some scatter in the halo mass, stellar mass relation of this number. And again, that also drives the, the choices of the survey. So given that stellar mass, halo mass relation, given a stellar mass, halo mass relationship and that scatter, um, this halo mass of that number gives us some range in stellar mass. And we're going to uh, use the K-band luminosity as a proxy for stellar mass. And so that gives us some range in stellar mass over which we think a Milky Way-like halo can live. And so we're going to be looking at Milky Way analogs that are in that range of uh, luminosities. We're going to choose environments that are similar to the Milky Way. And so the environment cut uh, requires that the, galaxy, or the, um, the analog is not in some massive group, and that it doesn't have uh, a massive neighbor within its uh, viral radius. This is actually agnostic to the presence of M31, our, our neighbor Andromeda. Um, some of our objects have Andromeda, some of our don't, and that's a really interesting question that will come up again later in the talk. And then there's some practical considerations that we just don't want to be observing in the galactic disk and those sort of things. So if I look at the, um, the local galaxy population and ask where can I get 100 of these objects, uh, I can do the following. So here is just the number, the cumulative number of objects. Here is their distance. If I ask where, how many objects are there with um, stellar mass, um, sorry, K-band luminosity in this range, uh, I get you know a whole bunch of these things, and I get to my number 100. If I go out to let's say 15 or 17 megaparsecs, if I then ask. Uh, now I have to impose this environment cut. I now get out to about let's say 20, 25. Uh, if I then in, uh, do my practical cut here, where I have to go past the um, away from the galactic center, I'm getting out to about 25 megaparsecs. In addition, I have some practical things, like I actually don't want to do all the imaging myself. Um, and so we have also put a cut in here that our objects need to be in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in order to have targeting imaging. Now, that's actually no longer a requirement. This, remember, was uh, decided five years ago when things like DETCALS wasn't available. Um, and so we are um, starting to fold in deeper imaging, which would lead us to push things a little bit closer. But within sort of 20 to 40 megaparsecs um, are our host distances. Now, past about, inside of about 15 megaparsecs, you actually can find dwarf galaxies in many different clever ways. So out to a couple of megaparsecs, you can find a dwarf galaxy just based on resolved stars. Uh, my colleague Peter Van Dokum is searching for dwarf galaxies just using surface brightness. Um, you can do this pretty well out to about 10 megaparsecs. Um, and his group just had a paper uh, yesterday showing that beyond about 10 or 15 megaparsecs, that way of searching for dwarfs doesn't work any longer. And so here at 15 megaparsecs and really to 20, we are left with not many resources to actually find dwarfs except for brute force spectroscopy, which is a perfect project for someone who has just gotten tenure. Um, anyway, so at 20 megaparsecs, a physical radius uh, of a uh, virial radius of the Milky Way, which is about 300 kiloparsecs, is equivalent to about a degree. That's a fairly large region on the sky. We don't go inside of 20 megaparsecs because there's only a couple of hosts, and then we're talking about gigantic um, areas on the sky. And so here is uh, one of our Milky Way analogs. And here is a zoom in. I have to make it, you know, there we go. Um, and this is one degree on the sky around that object. And so at 20 megaparsecs, again, my hope of getting down to minus 12, a 10 to the 6th or 7th stellar mass dwarf, is equivalent to R of 21. Um, and so within one degree, there's typically a few thousand galaxies uh, at an R of 21. So you can start to see where this is going to become some work. OK, great. So uh, a couple thousand galaxies. Maybe we can use photometric redshifts to get rid of some things and figure out where our objects are. And the problem here is that photometric redshifts simply don't work inside of about, I'm being conservative here, it's probably 0 0.1 uh, redshift. And so here are the SDSS um, DR12 photosies. Um, here is the photometric redshift of an object. Here is the spectroscopic redshift of an object. Um, and if you're just kind of doing you know, population statistics or something at larger redshifts, this works fairly well. 
Um, here, as is a function of uh, apparent magnitude, this is sort of the fractional error uh, of the photometric redshift. Um, and so our objects that we're interested in all lie at 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Um, and you can see that things are pretty bad, and then they just get worse uh, as you go to, uh, to fainter magnitudes. And so this isn't totally fair, right? So photometric redshifts were trained on shallow data. So most of the photometric redshifts uh, in DR12 are 17.7, the spectroscopic um, uh, limit of Sloan. You can see things aren't great, so we're factors of you know, 100 or uh, you know, 1 or 2. It's not great, but it's still OK, and it gets worse down there. Um, most of the spectroscopic redshifts um, that we have have an explicit color cut to get rid of low redshift galaxies. So things like DEEP or BOSS or EBOSS have explicit color cuts to get rid of anything that I'm interested in. Um, and the objects, or sorry, the spectroscopic surveys that have done sort of complete uh, follow-up are an incredibly small area, and the volume at low redshift is incredibly tiny. And so these are all things that are working against us. Essentially, we came to this project without a training set um, to figure out how to do this efficiently. Without a training set, you have to go and get your training set by yourself. And so we did. Uh, so this took five years of lots of observing proposals, and we will take any telescope time we can get. Um, we need large field of view. We're trying to search over a one degree area, uh, and we need to multiplex. And so uh, MMT Hectospec was a, uh, sort of the primary instrument that we use. This is through access through Arizona and Ben Wiener. Um, we've also been fairly successful getting AAT um, 2DF time. In addition, Magellan and IMAX has uh, contributed some of these redshifts. And we have a lot of redshifts. Um, so we have 20,000 redshifts for galaxies that are a magnitude to three magnitudes uh, fainter than Sloan. We've also gotten redshifts um, for bright galaxies. And another way of saying this is that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey spectroscopic survey actually isn't complete um, above 17.7. And so we've had to fill in a lot of that um, ourselves. And then we've gotten some uh, fainter redshifts as well. I want to point out that um, use, you know, this, Upcoming spectroscopic surveys, things like DESI and Foremost and Weave, which are incredibly exciting, the primary science uh, projects that will be on these will have explicit color cuts to get rid of low redshift galaxies. So uh, the DESI color cut will get rid of anything that's less than sort of 0.1 redshift or so um, by definition. And so we really, this is, you know, we, we couldn't just wait and do this project. I don't, uh, there's nothing on the, the horizon that's going to be able to do something like this. I'm going to pause for a second and just note, um, we have made all of these redshifts public. We are interested in only 25 objects of these 17,000. So there's an enormous amount of science to be done in there. And those redshifts are public. And if you're interested, uh, there's a website at the end of the talk uh, that uh, the data are, in fact, available on. There's a lot of interesting stuff to do there. OK, so what we did first, and starting off, is that we said, well, for one of our objects, for one of our hosts, we're going to get complete spectroscopic survey. We're just going to get uh, redshifts of every galaxy that's within the viral radius. And so this is this object, uh, NGC, blah, blah, blah. Um, and here is as a function of uh, R band luminosity. This is not cumulative. This is now, uh, oh man. Uh, sorry about that. There we are. Um, so within uh, the Vero radius, there's about 2,000 objects. We have spectroscopy for 85%, which is pretty good. Um, and I'll say why we didn't get higher than that. We also started to follow up stars, um, just worrying about compact objects. Uh, and we did that for a while, and we found that none of the stars that we got redshifts for were, in fact, misclassified galaxies. And indeed, if you take something like a Fornax galaxy and you put it at our distances, our galaxies, our satellites would all be uh, resolved by Sloan, with the exception of M32 type satellites. So M32 is that compact thing around Andromeda. It's weird, and I'm totally happy to not find it. So we are completely biased against M32 type galaxies, and I'll own that, um, in the sense that we just don't have the resources to follow up all those stars. There's a few thousand stars also within um, the Vera radius, so we don't do that. Um, and so with this you know, 85%, we noticed that um, there is a color cut that we can do that is conservative, that never gets rid of any low redshift galaxies, but removes the number or reduces the number of galaxies that we actually have to get 
uh, spectroscopy for. So here is an R minus I, G minus R color. These are Sloan galaxies and Sloan colors. Um, and here are, uh, for bright galaxies, so this is above the Sloan limit, uh, Sloan spectroscopic limit. And faint galaxies, so getting down to roughly where Sloan still has decent photometric errors, but things are getting a little hairy. Um, these are for all galaxies in the main SDSS survey. These are the BOSS galaxies, so I'm adding the um, uh, BOSS is the baryon acoustic oscillation stuff that some of the people in this room know a lot about. Um, you can see there's a mass of galaxies up here in a line. That's the explicit color cut for um, the BAO stuff, where they're looking for higher redshift galaxies. And so we are interested, so the red dots are all of our low redshift galaxies, we are interested in a completely complementary space. And so here I am plotting all of um, the galaxies between a fairly small redshift, oh man, slice um, between 0.005 and 0.01. And you can see that we can safely draw some lines um, to get rid of high redshift galaxies without worrying about sacrificing completeness. And again, completeness is going to come back in these slides. Um, completeness is absolutely critical, because if I'm telling you a Milky Way has five versus four satellites, that will actually have some cosmological implications. And so I want to understand my completeness exquisitely. And so we have these G minus R color cuts, um, and we feel like those doing those uh, will reduce the number of targets, but will not if, um, affect our completeness. And so we have some color cuts. There's some math there. Um, and you can see over in the faint things where we might be able to put our color cuts further in. And we decided not to do this for the following reasons. We did some numerical simulations. This is using semi-analytic modeling. Um, and found that for these faint galaxies with Sloan colors and Sloan um, errors, that although the star-forming galaxies, which is mostly what we're finding here, um, are well within the color cuts, and we could cut that window much farther down, if we're interested in all satellites, we are also interested in galaxies that are not forming stars, that are quenched. And so we decided to keep this window open such that we are absolutely complete for quenched galaxies as well. And this will come back um, to not haunt me in a little while. So given these cuts, um, we can reduce the target density substantially. So we can reduce it by a factor of two. So for this object, um, there were something like 2,000 galaxies uh, with an RVRA radius, blah, blah, blah. With the R, G, R minus I, G minus GRI color cuts, we can get down to about 800 per galaxy. And in this particular object, uh, we found two satellites. And so one of my senior esteemed colleagues, whose I will not name, uh, said that this is the least efficient survey that he has ever seen. And I'm proud of that, and that's awesome. Um, at the moment, I probably should own up to the naming of our objects. Um, and this actually made it into the paper. So this is the Saga survey. And so uh, a Yale undergrad, actually, at dinner one night, came up with the way to name and to name each of our individual hosts. And so we name our hosts after Saga's stories. And so this one is Narnia. Um, our first object was Odyssey and Gilgamesh and all these things. And I actually ended up reading both of those um, sagas for the first time ever. But anyway. OK, so these cuts uh, basically reduce, you know, uh, um, push us towards lower redshift. So black are all galaxies from Sloan. Red are our G minus R color cuts. And so you can see we're just being pushed to lower redshift on average. Um, green are the boss color cuts. And so you can see that you know, we really are operating in a very different space than many of the other surveys. OK, so we have now done this. We have complete spectroscopic coverage for eight hosts using these GRI color cuts. Um, so again, here, this is apparent luminosity. Um, these are for our uh, cleaned up proper name hosts. Um, and you can see that we have pretty good completeness for all of these objects. So for all of these, we have at least 82% complete down to 21. But in fact, we're doing much better than that. And so here are for six of those eight, we have greater than 90% completeness. In two of these things, we have essentially 100% completeness. Those two or three percent are all, you know, like whatever. I can not worry about those. So we have complete spectroscopic coverage. And so when I say we have N satellites, we really do have N satellites. And so let's actually look at these eight hosts. I accept that this is not 100, and we're not going to be able to answer all of our questions, but we're on our way. So let's actually do science for a few minutes um, with these couple of objects. And so here are combining all eight hosts. This is the difference in velocity versus of, of the dwarf galaxy versus its host as a function of projected distance. 
the green and the red, no, that's not red, green and yellow are what you would expect um, for an object to be bound. These are just point source um, uh, uh, bound velocity curves. And so anything outside of those curves is presumably not bound. Um, the dotted line is the virial distance. And again, we are complete within 300 kpc. So we're complete in here. And so the fact that there are a whole bunch of objects that scatter within just very close to the host galaxy means that we're not dealing with a ton of interlopers in our samples, or at least suggests to me we're not dealing with a ton of interlopers. And so we define a satellite as being inside of the virial radius and within plus or minus 250 kilometers a second. And so I could have defined it as being inside of one of these curves, but we actually just felt that it was easier to compare to models and just easier to explain by saying, you know, we have a straight cut at plus or minus 250, and we call that thing a satellite. OK, so we found 14 new satellites in these eight hosts. Um, there's 27 around uh, total, so the other whatever 14 minus 27 is uh, came from Sloan. Um, and we can start plotting luminosity functions. And so here's a luminosity function of the Milky Way, so just cumulative luminosity function. It's a function of absolute um, magnitude. The gray region is where we are not complete. The Milky Way is complete. Um, we have one system where we have more satellites than we would expect from the Milky Way. And many of our systems have less satellites than we would expect from the Milky Way. Um, indeed, there's a couple of objects that really are quite different um, in terms of luminosity function. Again, we can say that these are complete luminosity functions. And so you might say, well, that's not totally fair because each one of these hosts, there is some range in stellar mass and maybe there's some range in host mass. And so what we can do, and I'll show you a, a bunch of these plots in a moment, um, here again is the observed luminosity for, function for the Milky Way. That's just what I showed you. And then in orange, um, with one and two sigma contours, is uh, basically a, a CDM plus a, kind of an abundance matching toy model. Um, where this is the predicted luminosity function for a stellar mass, um, an object that has a stellar mass of that actual stellar mass, and then the uh, scatter that you would expect. And so the Milky Way for this particular realization, and it's a simple model, we understand that, um, is essentially within the one to two sigma um, contours of the uh, predicted luminosity function. But you'll note that uh, the, it's a little bit high on this side and a little low on this side. And that's something that we're seeing in all of our hosts. So this is the same thing now for all eight hosts. So again, we see places where the luminosity function is above the prediction substantially and a lot of places where it's below. But in most cases, at the bright end, we're above, and at the faint end, we're below. And so the conclusion just from these eight hosts is not going to knock anybody's socks off. Um, but they generally agree within two sigma, but these shapes really are different. They're shallower than what we predicted. And so you can start to see what we can do with 100 hosts. We'll really be able to say something about so the dark matter predictions and then folding in um, whether or not baryons can help us there. So I would say stay tuned on that. The result that I'm actually both most surprised at um, and I think is the least, the most interesting. Whoa. interesting, um, is that all of our satellites, with one ex kind of sad exception, um, are star forming. So if you just kind of look at this, you can see that these are all basically blue. I argued earlier that our color cuts would include galaxies that are not star forming. Our spectroscopic follow-up would have found quenched objects, things that are not star forming. And so these are actually kind of obscenely high signal to noise, frankly. Um, you can see here we've got, uh, you know, ab absorption lines. These are, this is actually a pretty random sample I just pulled out of the paper. Um, we certainly see quenched galaxies at other redshifts, um, and we do see one of our galaxies is quenched. And so we have the signal to noise to have seen uh, absorption line spectroscopy, and yet 27 out of th uh, 26 out of 27 are satellites showing emission lines, that is, um, show H alpha, and therefore we assume are star forming. Compare this to the Milky Way, where only two of five of the satellites um, are star forming. And then moreover, if you go to M31, which is probably a bit larger, but nonetheless, two out of nine of its satellites down to the same luminosities are star forming. And so um, this kind of struck us as being quite interesting. Furthermore, oh, that wasn't me. Um, furthermore, we have one quenched galaxy. This is this guy right here. Um, it's actually a satellite of the most massive satellite 
in that system. And so it's actually a satellite of a satellite. And so actually that guy is kind of interesting. And so, um, you know, I don't know what to say about this except that maybe we need to start revisiting um, some of the uh, efficiency of quenching um, for satellites. There's a lot of simulations out there right now that are trying to uh, match the quenched fractions in the Milky Way um, to simulations. I'm thinking specifically of like the latte simulations and that sort of thing. And so if this Milky Way is in some way strange, we're actually fooling ourselves a little bit. And so I, you know, kind of two slides just to think about what's going on there. This might actually not be super surprising. Um, here are the properties of the Milky Way satellites. So their color, um, surface brightness, and effective radius as a function of um, luminosity. Um, and the notice here, the three faintest satellites here are actually somewhat red. Here are our satellites, and um, you can kind of see the Milky Way satellites are, in fact, kind of red um, for uh, the average population. Another thing we thought about is maybe this is due to some kind of conformity signal. That is, maybe we're picking Milky Ways that are star forming, and therefore their satellites are also star forming. Um, we have not done that. We actually have star formation rates. So this is a star formation rate of the host galaxy. The Milky Way is here in red, and the red points are the eight hosts that I've shown you. Um, and we span actually quite a wide range of star formation rate of the host itself. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. Um, we are, have a lot of ongoing follow-up at the moment to study the satellites themselves to see if there's anything interesting there. So we have completed H1 measurements, so we have gas measurements for all of our galaxies. We have resolved optical spectroscopy for all of our satellites so we can measure masses. And so there'll be a fair amount coming out on the satellites pretty soon. One of the things that I am most worried about and I think is kind of the major worry that people have of the survey is that maybe you're missing quenched galaxies because their low surface brightness, and Sloan doesn't find low surface brightness galaxies. And so we are thinking about that uh, fairly deeply right now. And the way we're going to address that is looking at uh, deeper surveys like DECALs and HSC imaging and compare the Sloan and see if we actually are missing satellites. Um, I probably am not even going to discuss this plot a whole lot, but we've done this for at least the one overlap um, where we have overlap between DECALs um, and SDSS. And I'll just say that while SDSS has its own personality quirks in terms of the photometry, all the other major surveys do as well. Um, and so for DECALs in particular, um, there's a lot of low surface brightness galaxies in the catalog that actually when you go and look at the models are in fact not real. And so we're, this is a, a harder comparison than you might think, but we are definitely working on it and trying to do it. That said, in this one host, um, we didn't find any sort of major population of low surface brightness galaxies that you would worry about. And I think the reason is because is we got kind of lucky, I guess. Down to minus 12, that is a Leo 1, the surface brightness of, there's a surface brightness absolute luminosity, or surface brightness luminosity um, uh, correlation. And down to minus 12, Sloan basically picks up all of those objects. They have surface brightnesses of 24 or so magnitudes per square arc second. If we went any deeper, we'd be in big trouble. So we're not going to. Um, so we don't think we're missing a large number of low surface brightness galaxies. OK, so um, in the last kind of five or 10 minutes, I just want to talk about how we are going to achieve our goal of actually getting 100 Milky Ways and actually being able to say something fundamental. Um, and to do this, we really uh, have to, oh, that's so awesome. I'll just put them all down there. Um, we have to do a lot of work. Um, and we have to reduce the target density. Basically, we don't have the spectroscopic resources in the next couple of years. Um, to continue getting thousands of spectra for every host to get to our 100. And so we've explored a couple of things that you think might work and just really haven't had much luck. Um, and then we, we, we do have a strategy. So we've explored machine learning, um, trying to ask whether or not there is something in either the catalog data or the raw pixel data um, that we can throw into some machine learning thing and it can spit out probabilities for us and we can um, uh, reduce the number of that way. And this has really not worked very well at all. And I think the problem is, is that we are talking about tens or 20, or even if we're really lucky, hundreds of objects. And machine learning, all the various different flavors of machine learning, just doesn't do well when you're talking about hundreds or even thousands of objects. You need to get up to millions of objects to get a lot of traction. And we just aren't in that regime. So we're not in the regime where machine learning can really help us a lot. Um, the next thing we're trying to do is just update our photometric catalog so that we have better photometry. So going from Sloan to DECALs and HSC, that will improve our photometric errors. 
um, will presumably um, improve some of our surface brightness cuts and maybe we can get some traction there. Um, but what we've really done is trying to design a strategy where we can reduce our target density down to something like 200 objects per host, which is essentially one pointing with AAT or MMT. Um, so we can do this one pointing per host um, and then understand, characterize what we are missing so that we can do uh, completeness uh, corrections to our luminosity functions with some confidence. Um, so essentially, we're throwing out the idea that we truly are 100% complete and moving to something where we can probabilistically say that something is complete, but we haven't actually done all the spectroscopy. And so uh, I will show a plot, although I I'm not going to talk through this too much. And so here the idea is, is that this is the fraction of satellites that you would miss if, let's say, you targeted 200 objects or 400 objects or 1,000 objects. And we're aiming towards getting something like 200 objects, which is just matched to our observing resources. Um, and so if we were not ranking and doing no color cut in order to not miss 100% of the objects, you know, to miss no percent, you'd have to go all the way, kind of all the way out here. With our color cut, we need to get something like 1,200 objects per host in order to be um, somewhere close to complete. Um, and here what we're doing is ranking objects. And so we're ranking them by some kind of probability. Um, and so we are missing objects, but we're missing objects that are less likely to be satellites. And then we can fold that into the luminosity function um, and predict what our uh, completenesses are. And so if, mm, uh, if we just use uh, photometric redshifts and we want to, say, get to something like 10% or so, we're still up in the many hundred regime where things aren't going to help us very much. And instead, what we started to do is look at our training sets in color space and try to do this sort of, now it's, I guess, sort of fashionable, the Gaussian mixture models and that sort of thing, to predict likelihoods that are essentially really good probabil um, uh, photo Zs um, using our data and using all the data that we can find at low redshift. Um, and that seems like it may actually get us to the point where we can confidently target just one pointing per uh, host and have some understanding of a well-characterized incompleteness. And that's kind of where we're moving to at this point. Um, so the conclusions, although um, you know, some of them are sort of interesting, really is a state tuned. And we've now sort of set the groundwork to be able to answer some of these really big fundamental questions. Um, so we want to characterize the satellite functions around 100 objects. You know, so far, we have done the hard work um, and are sort of just beginning to reap those benefits. Um, and so to have these complete luminosity functions, we've taken close to 20,000 redshifts. Um, we have found something like 25 satellites across 16 objects. We have found really 14 across eight complete objects. We have uh, incomplete uh, data for a whole bunch of others. Um, we find a significant variation in the luminosity functions, although it's somewhat consistent pr with predictions. Um, the shape of our luminosity functions are interesting. I think that will actually um, turn out to be something that uh, will tell us something somewhat fundamental about either baryon physics or dark matter physics. Um, and then I think the big result at the moment is that we're finding a lot of star-forming satellites. And that may say something about quenching mechanisms in a Milky Way-like halo. Um, if you're interested in either the paper or sort of pretty images and to, to prove to yourself that you can't do this with uh, human AI or human machine learning, um, all of the satellite, satellite images are at um, the website here, as well as the Redshift data. Um, so I'll stop there. So we've done, oh, I took that slide out, I shouldn't have. Um, the, we've done model, or we've put fake galaxies into the Sloan data. So something like Fornax, which is not forming stars and um, has a typical surface brightness of, of its particular luminosity. Um, if you put Fornax into Sloan at these distances, it's super obvious. Like it's just not, it's not a problem at all. That's not what we're worried about. What we would be worried about are low surface brightness galaxies that are like the, the ultra diffuse things. So things that we don't see in the Milky Way. So the quenched galaxy, dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way, we would have easily detected. And so this idea of quenching is really, it's, that's still an issue, is that we're not quenching the things that we know should be quenched, um, let alone the things that are ultra diffuse and may or may not be there as well. Um, hi. 
um, your luminosity functions are really based on a few objects, right? Yeah. So how can you really be sure that they're different from each other statistically? Oh, so they're just, um, I agree with you. We, that's why, that's the whole project, right? Um, is we want 100 of these systems so that we have many, many satellites and we can start doing statistics. So um, when I was saying that the luminosity function shapes are different, they're not different within, you know, two sigma. It, so they are similar. It's just that with these eight objects, they all are consistently having this difference in shape. I think that's interesting. I'm not saying that's a result. Um, and that it's something that maybe with 100 Milky Ways we can say something about, and that will be a result. If you add them all together, do you find the Milky Way luminosity function? Or? Um, that's a good question. I don't remember what the answer is. It's similar. I mean, I, I showed you sort of all of them in one plot together, and you can kind of do that in your head. It's similar. Um, again, I just don't think the statistics are there to say that much. So I haven't thought about this stuff much, but you're basically it's basically trying to make a sample based on mass. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything in age for the galaxy that would affect this type of work? So we have been agnostic in terms of the star formation rates, which is pretty close to an age. Um, and we'd like to ask that question. So in this, you know, in the sample, we'd like to have a whole range of merger histories and stellar masses. Uh, sorry, and um, star formation rates at present day. Um, so we could have just selected Milky Ways that are both Milky Ways in their stellar mass, in their environment, and in their star formation rate, and many other different properties. Um, but I felt like that was not an interesting question. I really want to know is, you know, what is the luminosity function around a Milky Way mass halo? And to answer that question, we need to have, be much more agnostic in terms of the properties. Would you expect that to, to change with age? So we'll be able to account for that. So, you know, we have merger trees, and so if we see, you know, gal if there's a prediction that galaxies that are not forming stars now have different kind of merger history. We'll see that. We'll be able to test that. And that's the key. Robin? I just wanted to make sure which luminosity functions you were comparing to. So these are from your semi-analytic models from many dark matter only simulations. Exactly. Exactly. So there was one thing that can help with this shape of the luminosity function that you didn't mention when you discussed the two-week fail problem. And that is the effect that tides have on satellites of different sizes. Um, and I can conceive of how that can have exactly this effect because like things that are large enough to experience dynamical friction will be preferentially destroyed so that hollows out that I totally agree what we're trying to do is give you observations yeah. to test that prediction right you can do it a whole bunch of if you just add baryons you can also do that and so I, I, I basically we're trying to have a sample that we can test all these different amazing ideas um, we can't test it in the Milky Way with you know five satellites or ten satellites. And, no, um, with the sample that we have now, we also really can't test it. But within a couple years, and particularly now that we have a method that we think um, will work to reduce the target density and get us to this hundred, that I think will happen in the next couple of years. Um, and so I think the, the future is exciting. Right now, the present, it's okay. Josh? <laughs> uh, yeah, so you mentioned that um, so going forward you're going to switch to sort of this more probabilistic method yeah. to do these type of statistical corrections. Um, how large are those corrections going to be, especially down near like the, the limit that you wanted to originally get at around VO1? Yeah, um, um, so it, we're still actually sort of revolving around it. depends on how much telescope we time we get, frankly. So um, we, you know, I would like, I, there is some tension between sort of the, the theory and observational part of this project. So I would like to get more objects so that the complete, the true completeness, this, the completeness is high. Um, we will absolutely make sure that it is flat as a function of luminosity, um, so that it's not, it doesn't dive down at the lower luminosity stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, with 200 objects, the corrections actually shouldn't be high if we're figuring out the probability of what is a satellite well. And it really comes down to that. And so you can kind of see where we're still deciding this, where we have a bunch of different curves here, and we actually really haven't decided on what we're going to use exactly. Um, and that just comes down to a little bit more modeling and thinking. I just wondered if near-infrared imaging would help with the photos and get rid of Yeah, so certainly. So we've thought about that. We've thought about adding Ys. Um, adding Ys actually didn't help us at all, which I was very surprised by. Um, but it basically, our color cut already gets rid of the things that Ys would have gotten rid of. What about JHK? Um, so JHK, 
Uh, I don't remember if we've added that. I, um, you know, with, we only have two mass, and two mass actually doesn't get us down very deep. Doesn't you kids cover a lot of this? Uh, it might. I don't think we've looked at that. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions. Let's thank Marla again.